Mark, for those who haven't come across you online, introduce yourself and tell our listeners what we're talking about today. Uh, I'm Mark Cooker. I'm an attorney with Jacobs Law Group, and we're talking about uh, lawsuits that pharmacies have filed against PBMs, pharmacy benefit managers, to assert their rights under their contracts and under state laws. You represent a ton of pharmacies, right? We have over 900 clients right now, yes. Is that, I don't want to say class action because I don't imagine it's that. It's not a class action. It's just a lot of clients with the same gripes. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. So class action is a very specific legal term that's very misunderstood. Uh, and a class action, the, the classic class action is a shareholder's suit where let's say, uh, oh, you know, you bought uh, stock in Facebook because you uh, thought uh, their earnings were this and it turns out their earnings were that and the stock went down and you could one shareholder could file suit on behalf of millions of shareholders only in the name of that one shareholder. And when that's done, there's a very complicated process where the court has to assure it's, it should go forward as a class action. This is a mass action. Every pharmacy is in the case under their own name. Now, the facts they're uh, claiming and the legal uh, basis for their claim is pretty much the same across the board. But each pharmacy is in front of the court. Each pharmacy brings its own claim. But in together, because if they act as a mass, there are tremendous economies of scale, tremendous savings that you can have rather than each pharmacy bringing its own lawsuit. Are these 900 that you've done pieces over time, or is this truly 900 in this mass action? There are pieces over time. There's 450 approximately in federal court in Pennsylvania. There's 45 in St. Clair County, uh, New Illinois. There's about 30 in Alameda County, California, and there's a bunch that we're preparing to file. It sounds like they're different courts, but is it kind of all the same lawsuit that you just then had to piece it to the right area? That's basically correct. It's basically the same claims brought in different courts. How did you get 900 pharmacies to join in? I mean, I know there's a ton of pharmacies, but how did your firm come to represent so many of them? We were approached a number of years ago by a group in the Philadelphia area uh, that had connections all over the country, and they reached out to pharmacies all over the country and were able to recruit a bunch. And since then, word's gotten out. And we've gotten hundreds more since that time. We're uh, basically working on a contingent basis, so uh, there's very little money, uh, if any, upfront required to join. Depends on what uh, terms you uh, want to uh, arrange, but in, in any event, it's mainly contingent, so there's no or a very modest upfront financial obligation. And um, the big reason is that PBMs are abusing pharmacies and they want to do something about it. That this situation has only gotten worse. It was bad when I started. It's only gotten worse. And it's really intolerable. And PBMs break the law. They violate the contract. They need to be held accountable. When you say when you started, what year do you define that as you becoming part of this fiasco of PBMs? Well, I was first uh, retained in 2014. We, I spent a year investigating the industry. I didn't know what a PBM was. When I got started, um, I spoke to everyone I could in any aspect of the industry I could. I spoke to PSAOs, wholesalers, PBM, former PBM owners, uh, people who worked with consultants for pharmacies, uh, independent pharmacists at all levels, and learned everything I could. And we fought our first case in February 2015. And since then, as you know, there's been a lot of... Uh, vertical integration in the industry that's been very harmful and um, some other uh, some other things have, have taken place which have harmful. On the other hand, there have been many, many, many state laws and state MAC laws and state PBM reform laws that really give pharmacies some weapons to fight with. As you learn about this, and first of all, do you get emotionally involved? Do you say, those sons of a bitches, look what they're doing and so on. That's number one. And number two, is it 
good as an attorney to get emotionally involved or do you want to say all right come on settle down we're gonna do this methodically um those are great questions and the answers to both questions are yes so so first of all uh just in my background uh, my parents were immigrants from poland they were holocaust survivors uh, they came to america uh my dad had a small business so i lived upstairs for 17 years my dad probably worked 90 I'm not exaggerating 90 hours a week my mom probably worked 60 hours a week what was that business it was a convenience store candy it was a old-fashioned candy store soda fountain with some groceries but i understand what it's like to be a small businessman um and i understand what it's like to fight large businesses to compete with chains i understand all those things when i see the abuses that take place in this industry and what i tell everybody is you know my dad wasn't a, a terribly wealthy man but he had one thing he knew he set the price of everything he sold everything in his store mm. he knew of some he knew what it would sell for before somebody bought it pharmacy doesn't work that way the pharmacist has someone come in fills a prescription puts through the claim and boom could then find out that he's going to be paid here. She's going to be paid less than acquisition costs, sometimes a lot less than acquisition costs. Pharmacist has no control over their sales price, which is a pretty insane business model. So when I see the abuses that happen and I see the arrogance of the PBMs and I see how they try to rig the system to avoid being held accountable, of course, I get uh, angry and emotional. At the same time, I think there was a line from The Godfather, The Godfather 3, uh, don't get angry, it clouds your judgment. Maybe it was Godfather 1, one of them. Don't get angry, it clouds your judgment. So uh, in our firm, we conference everything, <laughs> we discuss everything, and we I, I run everything past cooler heads uh, to make sure that uh, we're, we, have, we must act in a cold, calculating, and unemotional fashion, ultimately. Ultimately, we may make our decisions that way or else we could get into trouble. You bring it to the group just to make sure that you say, all right, am I thinking straight on this? Exactly. We have a group of five attorneys in our PBM litigation group, and we have conferences at least once a week. And we run things by each other to make sure. And, and you know, it gets a critical review. Everything gets a critical review from people who are not emotionally yeah. invested in it, which is really important. Uh, to make sure that um, it makes it makes legal sense, logical sense, as well as being satisfying emotionally. Because a lot of times you might think that you're doing something non-emotionally because maybe your head's not burning and your ears don't feel hot and that kind of stuff, but you still might be on the emotional level without even realizing it, so you kind of check off with someone. Yeah, you have to do that because I've been so immersed in this for so many years that you just need another more detached perspective. Mark, someone says, well, hey, if you don't like it, don't sign the contract. PBM will go on and find somebody else. Now, I know from being an independent pharmacy owner, it's hard to sign a contract you can't even see. But besides that, that's an important point. What's the simplest answer to that saying, hey, if you don't like it, don't sign it. Let's talk about that. The first point is that pharmacists actually have rights under the contract that they can assert that they're really not aware of. OK, for instance, the first thing that was decided in our case years ago when we filed the first lawsuit was the following. Um, it was then Catamaran that became Optum. Uh, we, the suit was mainly over Mac pricing. And uh, they took the position, Mac price is whatever we say it is. We took the position, Mac price cannot be whatever you say it is. Because, first of all, there's language in the contract that actually puts some limitations on the PBM's discretion in setting the Mac price. Uh, actually says, I mean, I can read to you, this is from the Optum Provider Manual. Administrator determines MAC pricing based on the review of pricing information from nationally recognized pricing service, one or more national drug wholesalers, and publicly available results of CMS's survey of NADAC prices. 
uh, uh, prices, which is NADAC. And there's similar language in the provider manuals, the other two PBMs. So it means they can't just set any MAC price. They want they take that position. They act that way. When you appeal it, when you make a file a MAC appeal, they deny it uh, with I would say deliberate disregard of what the actual wholesale price data. But the bottom line is the court has already ruled in our case that the MAC price must be connected to the wholesale market. Secondly, secondly, most states, I probably 33 or 34 states at least, have MAC laws that also require the MAC be connected to the wholesale market price. So, so the first thing is you actually they actually have rights under the contract. Uh, the second thing is this: um, the worst part of the contract most onerous part is the arbitration clause because, and the, the arbitration clause in the Optum agreement and in the CVS agreement, because the arbitration clause in effect takes away your ability to vindicate the rights you do have under the contract because you can't sue in court and you have to sue in arbitration. And if you sue in arbitration, each pharmacy has to bring their own case. They can't combine multiple pharmacies into a case. And the arbitrator's fees alone that you have to pay cost $400 to file a complaint in federal court, cost $4,000 to file a complaint with the American Arbitration Association. And that's just the start because you now have to pay half of the arbitrator's fees, which will be tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. So the arbitration clause functions out of, out of a, as a get out of jail free card. And what the PBMs do, and they're not unique in this, other businesses do this too, is they build the arbitration clause into their business model. So basically, they can screw the pharmacy. Mm. They basically set MAC prices that are indefensible, and they rely on the arbitration clause to act as a wall against any efforts to hold them accountable. And that's why it's so important that we have defeated the arbitration clause now in two cases. I'm going to play devil's advocate. I hate the PBMs with a vengeance, but I got to ask it here. All right. So the contract says there's an arbitration clause in there. And it also says before you can come to court to complain against the PBMs, you have to run a sub four minute mile, whatever. And so <laughs> I pull my pen out or through the PSAO and I sign it. Well, I'm the dummy that signs it. I know I can't run under a four minute mile and maybe I should know that arbitration costs a lot more. So it's still my responsibility to not sign that. What is a response to that? I hate that. I hate to think that we've signed stuff that we can't even begin to do just like a sub four minute mile. But what's a response to someone that says, hey, you signed it. The response is that there's a doctrine in the law, I hate to sound like a law professor, called an un unconscionable contract. Okay. For a classic example of unconscionable contract, right? Loan shark. All right. So you borrow money from somebody at an interest rate of 40% a week. No bones about it. It's 40% a week. You know it's 40% a week. That contract's illegal. Doesn't It's illegal. It's usury. It's illegal. It's unconscionable cannot be enforced. The problem, you know, with those contracts is, you know, you know, they're not enforced in court. <laughs> they will be enforced. <laughs> but they could never go to court to enforce that contract. But, they, you know, but, but that's an example. There actually are, um, you know, payday loans where the interest rates are 600%. Interesting. So these contracts, uh, the court have hold that there's a lack of meaningful choice. It basically, if you need to sign the contract, in order to get enough customers to keep you in business, then you had, then you lack meaningful choice. Interesting. And therefore, if it is oppressive and unfair, it's got, it's not just you lack choice, it's oppressive and unfair. And it is so onerous that you can't vindicate your rights, then it is unconscionable. Arbitration doesn't have to be unconscionable. You can have arbitration that, that 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 is legitimate but 
But the, what they do is they pile on, it's not just arbitration, they pile on these conditions. You have to pay the, half the arbitrator's fee. You, you can't consolidate claims with other pharmacies. That's what makes it impossible. You know, we filed a case at arbitration for 26 pharmacies. We were fine with it till they said you had to split it into 26 separate arbitrations. Then at that point, it was going to, you know, because that cost, it cost $50,000 just to find out that you have to split it to 26 separate There's no way we were going to go 26 times 50,000. You know, the mere fact that you signed it is not enough to um, force you to arbitrate under intolerable conditions. Most pharmacists don't sign something with any intention not to follow through on it because we're used to a lot of handshake deals with our customers and vendors and those kind of things. I know you don't want to go into a contract thinking you're going to break it, that it's not fair, but it never dawned on me that a contract might not be legitimate. Like you said, in our Pennsylvania case, the 430 pharmacies had never seen the arbitration clause. The PSAO saw it, uh, the PSAO signed it, but they were not allowed to even show it to them. So that's, that, that's contrary to the very, the, the whole idea of a contract is a meeting of the minds you know, is so I offer to sell you this for ten dollars. You agree to buy it for ten dollars. How could you have a contract to something you never saw? You know, there's uh, that part of it as well. And um, the other thing is, um, in the Optum case, the arbitration clause is at page one hundred twenty-five of a hundred sixty-page provider manual. It's not even identified in the table of contents. Does anybody read the provider manual? And you don't sign the provider manual. You don't sign it. It just shows up in your provider portal someday. And they say you're now, everything you're now doing is subject to our provider manual. So that's the so called contract that they want to hold, uh, they wanted to hold the pharmacies to. And the California court would have none of it. They just had none of it. You are responsible for a recent win against this arbitration clause and so on. Is that right? Two. Two recent wins. Two recent wins. That's fascinating. I read that and I, I actually texted my wife and I don't involve her too much in the business. Well, she doesn't want to be involved in the business. But I said, this is fascinating to me that I'm no longer just the dummy who signed a contract. That contract can actually be like illegal. And that was fascinating. So that's why we're talking even. I remember like 10 years ago. I was so pissed at the PSAO saying, we never saw this contract. And they would say to me, well, go look at the provider manual. I'm like, that's bull crap because the provider manual doesn't have this, this, and this. And they're like, yeah, it does. Go look. You can see it has something about this. It has something about this, something about this. And I'm like, okay, you got me on that one. I'm going to read that. But why can I still not see the contract? And they gave me some horse manure answer, and I kind of just went on with life because you figured you were screwed. You couldn't do it, so you kind of went along just like with the cable company or something like that. But is there anything behind that? The PSAO is not showing the contract? Is that nonsense? It's, uh, it's, it's insane. I mean, I got to tell you, when, again, when I started, I said, what? I mean, like, what? <laughs> what? How can they not? And, and um, but it's... It, it's, it's, it's contrary to every notion of what a contract is. It makes no sense. What I used to say, so I can still say it, this entire industry is built on a foundation of contractual quicksand. It, you know, it's not a contract. And, you know, the decision we got in Pennsylvania uh, specifically said that, that if the, if, the, if the pharmacies could not see the contract, they're not bound by the arbitration clause, period, done. Um, California, they went further and, and also talked about all the substantively unconscionable provisions. That is, in addition to the fact you couldn't see it, the fact you can't, for instance, you didn't get a trial, okay? You can't get a trial with witnesses. You can only get a trial by documents. You can't subpoena witnesses. You can't take discovery. Is this beyond even arbitration or are you saying these are the arbitration rules? These are the arbitration rules. It's absurd. You know, they don't have to give you any information at all, anything. They don't tell you anything. You basically have to know what your whole – you have to even approve your whole case before you file, uh, which is, contra again, contrary to, to uh, 
basic notions of fundamental fairness. You know, somewhere, it, it seems crazy, but somewhere built in into our legal system, there's a concept of fundamental fairness. And it's actually still in our system. It actually is in there. But what happens is slick lawyers, and they, believe me, they have very good lawyers, find ways to use process, to use basically what you know, layperson will call legal technicalities and procedures to frustrate your ability to get a fair shake. And the classic is this whole arbitration thing. There's a whole body of case law, Supreme Court case law, they have now built up to use what the Federal Arbitration Act was an innocuous little law passed in 1922. And in the last 20, 25 years, it has been used by big business to squash consumers and small business. The arbitration thing, it makes a lot of sense at its base. Hey, let's not take all the costs. Let's make it cheaper sure. and let's do sure. it quicker. Hey, we're on the same side. Mm -hmm. It made sense. But that's fascinating what you say about the general fairness. I'm thinking about my late father now. Let's say he wasn't in pharmacy. He was, so he was skewed to the pharmacist side. But let's say he wasn't. Mm -hmm. I would go to him for advice, you know, and sometimes he would set me straight and say, well, Mike, you're upset or this or that, but let's pretend that I was able to get my wits about me and just to explain it to my dad. It would be like him saying, well, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a general fairness that is supposed to be there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, you know, and, and like I said, these, these, these concepts are as old as the U S constitution and but they've been perverted and and twisted around um and it's you know it needs to be set right and so i i'm, I'm happy we've we're starting to set it right because like i said we've won these two issues uh, we've won it in two cases they're appealing both i think that i'm i'm really pretty confident they're not gonna they're not gonna win those appeals i really don't think they will was this a big win something that we haven't seen either ever or recently I think it's a big win. One case came down in May 28th, and the other one, I think, in the middle of late June. The one in California was mid to late June. Um, I'm not surprised we won um, because I, I knew the law was on our side here. It took a long time to get one of those decisions. So, But it is a big win, uh, and, and um, it could be a real game changer in opening the door for basically, you know, it's like, I'm mad as hell, and now you don't have to take it anymore. You really can do something about it. You and I know you won this just because you're a great attorney. There's no doubt well, about that. But well, okay. was there anything else that led to this win? Was the timing right? So let's take your attorney skills out of it. Mm -hmm. Was there anything else going for us as a group now? Was the timing right? Well... These concepts of fairness were already there in the law, and we just had to tip, pull them out, show them to the judge, and have the judge decide it. Like I say, as I wish it came sooner yeah. uh, in terms of the timing. But those decisions on which we based our, uh, our arguments were from the early 2000s, hmm. 2006, 2008, 2013. They were, they were, they were not that recent. The Rutledge case, I don't know if that's what you're getting at or not, really had nothing to do, which is a very, very important decision, don't get me wrong. That had nothing to do with our situation. I have a good friend that told me as I complain about the business, and he's like, Mike, don't worry too much about things, because in life, you're only going to go so far down one road before the roads that used to look not so good start to look a little bit better. And... I'm wondering if, in this case, maybe the judge on just the fairness thought, maybe they're almost like, we don't even have to hardly argue this bull crap anymore. Just by sniffing it, you can tell it's not fair. I wonder if it got so bad that there was only one direction to go. I know only know is what the judges put in their written opinions. Um, and that's the way they read. <laughs> you know, if, if just like we've said, if you can't see a contract, how can you be bound by it? It's pretty, pretty straightforward and pretty simple. But Mark, why now? I mean, people have been fighting that for, like you said, maybe 15 years or 20 years. Why now does this judge decide this? It's got to be all on you. Okay. 
uh, you know, take it, right? I'll take it. But uh, you know, we, I, I, you know, I, I'm still in front of him. Okay. So I don't want to, I don't want to say anything that could in some way, uh, you know, affect things. Right. You can just say what's happened so far. No, I don't wrap him around my little finger. He's his own guy, but I do, I may say this about judge Mannion. He is genuinely concerned genuinely and, and and this is i mean oh this is true of all judges to some extent but really true of him i've been in front of him before he hmm. cares about giving the people in court a fair shake he really really does i think this just bothered him i think it just really bothered him now you you know his opinion speak for itself but i think it just bothered him as it should i mean he said that to us at a hearing a year earlier that this really bothered, troubled him, that these people were being held to a contract they couldn't see. Maybe it was the time that you brought this unconscionable argument in front of him, and it happened to line up with him being a person that that, well, legally, not just like you got him crying. I mean, legally, he understood that, and it was because of maybe him feeling that inside of himself. I mean, look, it's a common sense thing. Okay. All the laws on the books aren't worth a pitcher of warm spit unless they can be enforced right yeah they don't mean anything unless they can be enforced. to a large extent our society is on the honor system okay to a huge extent you know they can't you know they can't put every thief in jail right most people walk into place they don't shoplift all right <laughs> you know most people are relatively honest okay but to a large extent we're on the honor system all right if you have big companies who decide they're just going to grab every dollar they can any way they can and they don't care about anything else mm. okay and uh, then you need an enforcement mechanism because they've got the power and they've got the muscle and the one place where there's a level playing field is in is in, is in court a little guy can sue a big guy and they're both equal before the law i'm not the first person to say that believe me okay so when you rig this arbitration, like arbitration is supposed to be a good thing and it can be, it can be faster. There's no backlog in arbitration. It can be fair. But is it faster if you take 20, 26 pharmacies, sue one PBM and you split it into 26 separate cases? Is that faster? Is that cheaper? No. So that shows you how they perverted the arbitration system to make it impossible to win. And so it's not hard to, show that to a judge say arbitration good this arbitration horrible doesn't work impossible as i say our, the purpose of arbitration is to facilitate the resolution of disputes these arbitrations are deliberately designed to frustrate the resolution of disputes and that's why they lost and that's why i believe they will continue to lose that's very telling of an organization when they say that they say look we're on the up and up and everything if you don't like it though we're really concerned and we're gonna set up this great way to figure this out but when someone finally brings to the surface their quote great way of figuring it out is ridiculous and certainly is <laughs> the opposite of figuring it out it's like I'm a judge. Oh, so you're saying that, first of all, they said it was a good contract, but if it wasn't, look, we'll find a way to figure it out. But if the way to figure it out sucked yeah. on purpose, yeah. well, then you know you got a problem from the start. Then That's the right. whole contract is questionable. Right. Yep. You said you were in front of this judge before. What kind of different stuff have you been in front of him for? Well, the other case I had, is, this is kind of interesting. So um, before the great mortgage debacle of 2008. I've been involved in a lot of litigation involving fraudulent mortgages. Hmm. It's an old scheme. Okay. You, you basically, this was a number of years ago, you uh, build a bunch of homes that are worth $100,000. You price them at 180. You sell them to a bunch of first time home buyers who are very unsophisticated. You get them 90% financing because all they care about is their monthly, right? And you fraudulently qualify them for the loans by misrepresenting certain things. Um, and that was what the case was about. And it was really a forerunner because basically the whole mortgage debacle we had was to a large extent based on the same scheme 10 years, 10 years later. 
you go to close a house. You'd be there for three days. <laughs> yeah. A typical mortgage document is 24 pages long, okay? Deed is five pages long, you know? You'd be there for days and they'd say, well, yeah, but we'll give you this ahead of time to read. It's like, well, that doesn't mean anything. How do I know you're going to put the same document in front of me? You didn't sign the first one to agree this was going to happen. So you'd be there for three days. Yeah. Same idea with people breathing down the neck of a 25-year-old newly married couple or something trying to say, hurry up on this. Yeah, these were first-time home buyers. They just really didn't know. <laughs> it's crazy. Know what was going on. What's the relief that is on this pharmacist thing? I've got to think there's some money involved because your firm has to get paid. But I also know pharmacists would probably be just really happy if things change. But there's got to be relief there of money, it seems. Exactly. So there's two aspects of money we're uh, claiming in um, actually three, but two in Pennsylvania, three in California because of certain court rulings. So first is... Uh, to the extent the MAC price paid was below a, a national benchmark like NADAC. Uh, so basically what we call an underwater claim. So it should have been uh, at least at NADAC, if not above NADAC. So as the NADAC stands for National Average Drug Acquisition Cost, set by CMS by survey, um, plus a, maybe a margin on top of that uh, to cover some part of overhead. So, uh, one, so um, there's... Damage is being claimed for that. Another form of damage is the judge ruled, okay, you know, max stands for maximum allowable cost, right? What's maximum mean? The maximum that they're going to pay. All right. To who? I would think to the pharmacist. Okay, but the term maximum means the most or the highest. Yeah. And there should only be one maximum allowable cost mm. for all pharmacies in a health plan. All pharmacies who are participating in the plan, maximum connotes the singular. And, uh, you know, don't trust me on this. South Carolina legislature had hearings on this, and they all said, how can you have more than one MAC price? How can you have one MAC price for Walgreens, another one for an independent pharmacy, and a third one for CVS? Maximum means one. So the judge in our case ruled that we have a plausible claim that there can only be one MAC price. But we need evidence. We need evidence of how much more Optum or Catamaran paid CVS or Walgreens or some other large chains. And that has been hard for us to get so far. So to your listeners out there, if anyone has any evidence or any information about what large chains get, I would appreciate somehow reaching out to me. I mean, I've heard estimates of as much as $7 a script. As a difference between what large chains get and what independent pharmacies get on generics, uh, but we need we need hard evidence. From the very start, these PBMs had basically a monopoly. I mean, they had twenty five or fifty percent of the business of some of these plans. Yeah, well, I mean, we know the three biggest PBMs have between seventy five and eighty percent of the market. You can't not do business with someone who's 20% of your customers, 20%, 30% of your customer. You can't. You can't write that off and stay in business. Look, there's always some imbalance. There's always a more powerful party and a weaker party. But, you know, there's just a certain floor, minimal level of fairness that's that's got to be there or it just doesn't work. There's always going to be a weaker and stronger. I mean, the odds of it being the same are not there. Yeah, in our society, you know, you're dealing with Amazon, you're dealing with AT&T, you know, uh, Fi, I deal with Verizon <laughs> a lot. So, uh, you know, you're dealing with big banks. Uh, but there's also laws. In some cases, there's laws to protect people, uh, regardless of what the contract says. So and that's that's the really good thing about um, all the state laws that have been passed and are continuing to be passed to help address this. Because basically what the state laws are saying is that I don't care what's in the contract. You can't do this. For instance, now some law states have, I'm sure you get a lot, you hear a lot about GERs and BERs and DR and clawbacks. And now at this point, several states have passed laws making that illegal. North Dakota, Minnesota, New Jersey, Louisiana, among them, I think Texas has probably done it all also recently. I'm not even current on all of them. So that 
you know, that affords a lot of additional protection. So what's, so now they're, you know, now they're um, saying, well, those laws can't be effective because federal law preempts them. That's now what their argument is, even though the U.S. Supreme Court decided nine to nothing against them. States have a lot of power because they can say, look, we're just not going to allow that. And we're not going to give you whatever, a certificate to do business in our state, whatever that's called, a license. And then over to Arkansas, where the plans and can, I, I guess, sue the state and say, well, you have to give us this because we deserve it and so on. But at least then you're fighting state against company. You're not fighting a little corner pharmacy against a company. Right, right, right. The state will fight to preserve its law. And I think the big case right now is the North Dakota case or Whitty. I don't know if you know about that or not. But so since the Arkansas case was decided, the next big preemption case is the Oklahoma, the North Dakota case. North Dakota has a law against clawbacks and PACMA is fighting it. And that is in the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals right now, awaiting a decision, I believe. Once a state like Arkansas and North Dakota should they win? Once they win, let's say at the Supreme Court, is that like, all right, all 50 states now do this? Oh, yeah. Well, that's, our, that, that's what had. There's been a flood of legislation since Rutledge came down. Uh, it really has opened up the gates. Now, PACMA is still going to still fight this, at least for a while, because they got nothing to lose. So let's say Arkansas wins ABC law. Does mm-hmm. every state have to go and fight their own ABC in front of the Supreme Court? Every state has to pass its own law. But the Supreme Court's not going to hear 50 of the similar Arkansas ones. No. If everybody, if every state passed Arkansas's law, we'd be good. Since that law came down, you know, it's like playing whack-a-mole with these people. They found out these other tactics like clawbacks and things like that. So um, it's required some additional legislation. That was not decided in the Rutledge case. Something comes through Arkansas, goes to the Supreme Court. It's not really a federal law, then. It's more like all the states, if they have this law, they're all saying, great. Is that because nobody would be stupid enough to go in front of the Supreme Court again to hear the same argument? Or is there truly like a federal like mandate where, all right, that's done. No more question. All right, so here's, here's what happened in, in Rutledge. Arkansas passed a law. Uh, one of the things the law said was you can't pay a pharmacy, reimburse the pharmacy, less than its acquisition cost for drugs. There's a federal law called ERISA, E-R-I-S-A, Employee Retirement Income Security Act. It's a very well-intentioned law. This is another example of how sharp lawyers turn laws on their heads, just like your Arbitration Act was a good law. ERISA was a very well-intentioned law designed to protect workers and families um, who in, in employee benefit plans. Okay, that was the intent of the law. Was it to help Optum or, or CVS screw pharmacies? Absolutely not. But that law basically said in certain areas, the federal law will preempt any state law. The federal law will supersede and have precedence or priority over any state law. So if any state law occupied that area or conflicted with it, the state law would go. Okay? And this was designed really for when the federal law was more protective of uh, an employee uh, benefits than the state law would be. Then you'd have the federal protection. For the last 25-some years, big companies have used ERISA to protect big companies from states. Instead of ERISA being used to protect little people from big companies, they're using ERISA to protect big companies from states. State can't do this. State can't do that. Because what's happened in our country is, as no secret, we've had a lot of paralysis on the federal level. Nothing, you know, Congress is paralyzed and gridlocked. And whereas some states can take action. Of course, the interesting thing about PBM reform is it tends to be very bipartisan Blue states and red states have all enacted good anti-PBM reform laws. But nonetheless, nothing happens on the federal level. So um, um, the argument is that what Arkansas did stepped on the toes of ERISA and went into a federal area where they couldn't go. And the Supreme Court said, nope, what Arkansas did is just fine. However, there's 49 other states who would still have to do what Arkansas does 
in order to enable, give the pharmacies that protection. So they did not say that all 50 states have this protection for pharmacies. They said, if any other state wants to do it, they can do it. That's why you then had this flurry of legislation in the last nine months, I guess, uh, since Rutledge came down, where other states are regulating PBMs more aggressively because they, they basically, this, what, what the Supreme Court gave them a green light, but it, they can't, Supreme Court can't drive them through the intersection. <laughs> they still have to drive, they still have to drive themselves through the intersection. So driving through the intersection is simply passing a state law. It's not going all the way and fighting it in front of the Supreme Court again. It's just no. having the law. It's having the law. I've been told that. I've been told that these states who have maybe kind of hung back and maybe well, let's not spend time on it because it might not be a high priority because we don't know what's going to happen and we don't want to go in front of the Supreme Court and everybody's going to fight it, this and that. Now they can just say, hey, if we get the law, we're good. Yeah. I mean, the law still could get challenged, but you know what I, my attitude to that would be? Go ahead and make my day. Go ahead and challenge it. You know, there was a, Andrew Cuomo um, vetoed a law about a year ago. And it was very upsetting. I was in touch with the PISNY folks, the Pharmacy Society of the State of New York. You know, they're a really good, strong state organization. And it was infuriating. This was before Rutledge came down. And Cuomo vetoed it on the grounds that he thought that law would be preempted by ERISA. And Cuomo's a lawyer, and listen, he's obviously a smart guy, whether you like him or not. He's certainly a very smart guy. But what was infuriating about it is his own attorney general, Letitia James had written, joined in an amicus brief, that's a friend of the court brief, in Rutledge telling the Supreme Court why these laws, why the Arkansas law is not preempted. In other words, his own attorney general disagreed with him. His own attorney general thought the law was perfectly fine. He didn't listen to his own attorney. Now, you know, she did a couple other things the last couple of weeks he didn't care for, you know. Uh, I mean, don't, let, let's, let, let's be fair. He does not, he does not appoint her. He does, she is separately elected. So when I say his own attorney general, you know, she is separately elected. He didn't appoint her. Nonetheless, she is the chief legal officer of the state of New York and she knows what she's doing. So you would think the governor would at least pay attention to what she said. Guy like Cuomo, again, take away any likes or dislikes of him does his decision not to do that do you think we can just take that at face value that he just didn't think the federal had to bow down to the state there can we take that at face value or do we always look and say well he's bought off by this group and that group and he's from new york so you got to be careful <laughs> about that <laughs> you know well well okay so first of all um they just i believe passed another set of laws in new york and I mean, he's resigning effective another few days. Uh, he may actually have signed the new law. I don't know. So in all fairness, one should wait to see what happens with that new set of laws. It's either two or, it's two or two, three or four separate laws that have been passed by the New York legislature and are waiting the governor's signature. So in all fairness to him, now that Rutledge came down, if he signs the laws, or at least he doesn't veto them and lets the new governor sign them, then, you know, that that would give you an answer, whether it's the answer or not. You know, I mean, I don't think anybody ever can read the mind of what's what's influencing a politician. Um, typically, you know, they're only influenced by what would get them reelected. You know, that's, we all know that. So I don't, I don't know why he vetoed it. I really don't understand it. Um, but anyway, hopefully this round will get signed and uh, it'll the issue will just then go away. The PBM fight. Are you and I going to be long gone off this earth and this is just going to keep going and going and going? Or is there ever a time when, and maybe the time was, you know, last month when your lawsuits came through, is there ever a time when we kind of turn that corner or is this always just going to be, you know, frontline fighting for the rest of our lives and maybe some progress, but never a real end to it? That's a tough question. Um, I certainly would hope that. I mean, we intend to hold them accountable for what they've done and to create, help create, because we can't do it alone through litigation, but between legislation and litigation and educating the citizens and the voters, um, create a system that affords independent businessmen some stability and predictability 
and the ability to maintain, make a living doing what they do. You know, small business is so important. People need a choice. You know, we pat ourselves on the back in this country and say we have a free market, but this whole PBM system is the antithesis of a free market. They take away your choice. They force you to mail order. They force you to do this. They force your doctor to prescribe certain drugs on a formulary, even though they may not be medically the best for you. They have, in the name of free enterprise, in the you know, they've used their power to thwart a free market at many levels, at the consumer level, at the small business level, and independent pharmacists provide a level of service, you know, I, that I think most people would agree is better than most chains. So that needs to be preserved. So all I can say is I, you know, I can't predict what's going to happen, but I would hope and think that people would see that um, this, the system as it is, uh, stands the free market on his head. It's dysfunctional and it needs to have fundamental change. And we, we think litigation is one of the tools that can help bring that about. You're pretty confident that at least for your efforts is going to happen. Are you pretty confident? Well, yes. I mean, look, you never can predict the outcome of a case, but I know this. I've seen their pricing and some of their pricing is at levels so low, it cannot remotely be justified by any wholesale market data. You've got some drugs, they're paying 50% of NADAC, you know, for instance. It cannot be justified. If that goes before a finder of fact, I can't imagine any jury that understands the case, understands what it's doing, ruling in favor of Optum. They would have to rule in favor of us that the pricing was not just unfair, but violated the terms of the contract, violated the state MAC law, and Optum has to pay. Their whole legal strategy was not concocted around having a defensible price. It was concocted around being able to keep us from getting to court by blocking us with the arbitration clause, and, and they lost that, and they lost that. That wasn't by chance. They knew they were screwing us, and they knew there'd be no way to battle them in court. That's exactly right. I've seen companies do this before. I had a case against a payday lender, uh, charged an interest rate of 648% on a loan. So how does any lender work? Okay. No lender lends its own money. All right. No lender lends its own money. Doesn't happen. Lender gets money from somebody else. Okay. Who, the warehouse lender or some other kind of funding. So there was this payday lender that cut a deal with a bank. And the bank said, we'll lend you the money to then lend people at 648% interest. Okay. And the contract between the bank and the payday lender required the payday lender to have an arbitration clause in its contract with the poor schmo who's paying the usurious interest rate. Okay. Because, and it specifically said, if that arbitration go, clause goes, our deal is off. And let me guess, it wasn't out of the goodness of their heart with like a free arbitration. It was one of those that we're talking about here. Yeah, you couldn't have a class action. You couldn't have a mass action. So therefore, who's going to bring a, a lawsuit for like $400? The woman borrowed 200 She so had to pay 400 a month later. So yeah, it was all the entire business model was premised on a get basically immunity. They basically contracted themselves into being immune from suit. I like what you said, that this is going to be a trial by jury. Yes. Which I think plays into the unconscionableness of the case, because it's like the PBM is going to throw all these numbers around and the farmers is going to and all this stuff and blah, 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 and all these different terms and abbreviations and all that stuff. But when it comes down to it, it just doesn't seem fair. Uh, yeah. I think people have a fundamental sense of fairness. People, <laughs> they know that, you, you know, I, you know, you run a business, you got to get your ingredient costs pay up and pay for your overhead. To keep a roof, you got, you have salaries, you got rent, you got to pay for health care, health insurance for your employees, for crying out loud. That's a pretty big, that's a substantial number. We have a lot of different types of listeners, but let's say it's a pharmacist listening right now. Let's say it's a pharmacy owner listening right now. Is there anything they can do like this week? Can they get a hold of their state and tell them how's our fight going or what might they do? 
Well, they should certainly reach out to their state uh, pharmacy organization to keep abreast of legislative efforts in their states. I'm aware of several, probably more than several, probably 10 to 15 really active state pharmacy organizations. There may be a lot more out there that I'm just not aware of, but I know, for instance, Louisiana is very strong, Arkansas is strong, Georgia is strong, New York is strong, um, California is strong, um, Iowa is strong, you know, uh, and there's others. I, I, I don't mean to insult anybody if I left sure. some names out, you know, For sorry. Sure. It's a good sign. There's a lot of them, though. And they're all becoming more energized and active. Yeah. But, you know, that's one thing they can do. And I think they may want to think about joining our case, you know, and if they want to do that, they can reach out to me or people at my firm or talk to another lawyer about bringing another kind of case. There are other illegal actions that they do we haven't talked about. For instance, one thing they do, a couple things. For one thing is they're now violating, the, there's anti-clawback laws in a bunch of states. They're still clawing money back. It's illegal. They don't give a damn. They're still doing it. They act like they're above the law. Secondly, we know that there are some scripts where they pay the pharmacist a generic MAC price and build a plan for brand and collect huge spreads. We know that happens. We think that's illegal. And that's part of our case in Illinois and California that we intend to still pursue. There's, God knows, any any other number of shenanigans and games they play. Uh, they're very creative uh, at that, that I probably don't even know about. And I'm happy. I, you know, I still consider myself on a learning curve here. And I'm happy to talk. I will talk to any pharmacist, any place in the country, any time, remotely convenient, uh, just to hear what they have to say and see what I can learn. Well, Mark, thanks for your leadership. Like I say, boy, when I saw that a couple months ago, I've seen enough fights go in front of me and legal things going in front of me and all that kind of stuff. And when I see something big, I can tell it's big. Anybody can. We've seen enough stuff when we know something's big and this was big. And thank you for leading us into it. Well, you're very welcome. I'm really thrilled. But this is just the first. We're going to have more victories before this is over. So I'll keep you informed. I expect we will have more. I'm not a cocky guy. I'm not a bragger. I'm not a bragger, but I'm telling you, we're going to win more in this before this is over. The same that you said you're not a bragger and a cocky guy. I understand that because PBMs have taken us the other direction where pharmacists have turned into a bunch of bitching. I have fun picking on the teachers. My wife's a teacher. So I I have fun by saying we sound like a bunch of teachers sitting around bitching in the teacher's lounge. You know, (laughs) I mean, that's like not who we are, but we've been so beaten down that it happens. And so when it turns the other way, it's fun to be excited and send my wife a link to your article and things like that, because we've had this swing of emotion going the negative way that we all deserve to have a positive swing of emotion too. You used a little bit of a World War II analogy. I like to say uh, these victories are not the end. They're not the beginning of the end. They're the end of the beginning. That was Churchill. Churchill after the Battle of El Alamein. Good words. All right, Mark, we'll certainly keep in touch. Thank you very much. Appreciate your having me. Thanks for everything. All right. Talk to you again. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye.